The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYML LP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. Greetings and welcome to the Personal Safety Show. This is Marcus Melnick with Firearm Mentor, your host, and today we have Robin Sandoval from A Girl and a Gun. I met a different representative of A Girl and a Gun at the United States Concealed Carry Association conference back in September and wanted to do love the group. I think it's a fantastic, wonderful organization. And this representative referred me to Robin Sandoval, who I believe is the executive director of A Girl with a Gun. Is that correct with your title? Yeah, that's right. Sweet. Well, why don't you jump right into it? Can you tell our listeners what your background is, what your origin story is, and how you got involved with firearms and specifically A Girl and a Gun, which is a women's shooting league? Take it away. Yes, absolutely. I love talking about this because it's so relatable to so many other people in their journey, too, and learning about firearms or joining the firearms community. So I was actually anti-gun for most of my life, strongly anti-gun, did not understand why anyone needed one, was vocally a gun control advocate. And over the years, I just saw different vulnerabilities in our society. A lot of things that we're seeing nowadays in different conversations in different cities and circles But back at the time, what changed for me was watching the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Although I live in Austin, Texas, and we were safe from that disaster, I watched a modern American city become debilitated overnight. I saw families left on their own because first responders couldn't respond or didn't respond. And that was a real eye-opener. And there was a moment I saw at the Superdome hand her small children to strangers who were getting on a bus to Houston. And she said, please take them. I'll try to find you in a few days. And my heart broke for her. And I thought of different moments in our in history, of, of, hu- of human history, when mothers had to give their children away to survive. And I turned to my husband and I said, what do I have to do that that's never me? That no matter what happens, we can stay together as a family, we can hunger down, we can shelter in place. So my plan was to store peanut butter and tuna fish, and we would just stay together if something happened. And he said, if people are that desperate... Someone's going to kick in our door for our stuff that we've stored for our children. How am I going to stop them? And after arguing for gun control my whole life, I had no argument to that. It came down to these three little people, and I was willing to do whatever it took, and even if it meant learning something scary or getting more information. And so I agreed to get a firearm. And at this time, back in 2011, the end thing to do, marketing-wise, was for people to have happy hours. So hairstylists would have happy hour at the salon and... Real estate agents would have happy hour at the office or open house. And so that was kind of the end thing back in 2011. And at the time, I purchased my first gun. We, we, as, as a husband and wife, we purchased a gun that I thought would never be used. And we locked in the safe, never touched unless Hurricane Katrina hit Austin, Texas. But at the same time, he didn't want me to be afraid of it. And this woman, Juliana Crowder, was a fire instructor. And so she hosted happy hour at the range. And the idea was girls night out, just come She brought the guns, she brought her knowledge, and just made it welcoming. And I was scared to go. And my husband saw it, he heard about it through a friend, and he RSVP'd for me to go. (laughs) He signed me up. And I don't know if I was more scared of shooting the gun, going to the dirty gun range, meeting the other women. All of it was terrifying, but I went. And it changed my life forever because I learned this tool. I watched other women be confident with it, and they weren't afraid. I asked questions about other moms. How do you store this at home? How do you talk about this? What if people at work know that you have guns? Like all of those things. And it just gave me access to information and it gave me access to a community of support. So our little group started growing and every two weeks we would go back to Girls Night Out at the range and more people would come. And so then even as a newbie, you know more than the newer person. And so you start mentoring and coaching. And I thought, wow, if I'm really the one helping out here. I need to learn some stuff. And so I started taking more classes. I started competing, competing. I started mentoring. And Juliana said, I need help. This is really growing. And so she and I partnered and we partnered 50, 50, and we were partners for 10 years. I, she retired from the the business a couple years ago. So it's just me at the helm now, but uh, now we have girls made out at the range at 350 ranges across the country. We bring women into 
the range just to get women off the sidelines of their lives, whether it's competing or learning defense or home defense or just meeting other women, learning about gun safety, whatever place someone is in their journey, a girl in the gun is right for them. Awesome. I have a couple. I'm going to dovetail on what you said, and then I'm going to ask you some off script questions. There, during the time of Katrina, I was very, very worried, but not for what everyone thinks I was worried for. I was working for a public safety department, and we had sent four representatives down to Slidell, I think it was Mississippi, to help with the hurricane cleanup. And some of the photos that I, I received, I was really worried for these were my friends. I was really worried for these people. And one of them, who was our chief, he was a SWAT operator, and he was literally on one of those little rowboats with a machine gun, with utility crews going around trying to, he was doing the security work, but the, the crews were trying to restore utilities. Uh, and just some of the stories that came out of it were really unnerving that, that something like this could happen in the United States. It was kind of like a third world tidal wave or a third world earthquake where we're up, we're sending money like to the Caribbean or to different parts of the world. Lately, it, it has been Hawaii. So it was really unnerving for me. And I heard what you said about Hurricane Katrina. And the other thing that happened in the city of New Orleans is the police ended up confiscating and illegally collecting firearms because they didn't want people to be armed and get into conflicts. But the reality is, I think your husband's right. It's just like a tornado drill in a school, at least in the Chicago area. The likelihood of a tornado or the likelihood of a disaster is extremely low, but the impact of such a disaster is devastation. It's very, very high. So I'm a big believer in let's do some creative thinking. Let's do some fantasizing. Let's figure out what could be wrong. So in Texas, your risks are different than mine in Chicago. Actually, you're a lot safer. That was kind of a joke. I'm, I'm outside. I'm, I'm in the Chicago suburbs. I'm not actually in the city proper. But in Chicago, the biggest threat to us is a snowstorm or an ice storm. Now, in Austin, Texas, maybe you have one every 10 years, maybe-ish. The risk here is different. And that means the roads are impassable. You'd have to have some backup stuff. I've got a bunch of firewood for a fireplace in case the heat goes out. But there's a lot of practical applications for being what I call a quiet prepper. And that sounds like that's what you were doing, storing, although peanut butter and tuna don't go very well together. <laughs> no, they don't. I didn't know anything back then about storing anything right. or what to even store. I just thought, well, here's what we have at the food drive at Thanksgiving, you know, like the right. perishables. And that's kind of what I was thinking. Of course, now through my journey, I help women prep for lots of things and here in Austin, we do get, we have snowmageddon, <laughs> snowmageddon, and we have ice storms just because we still have the infrastructure right. to manage the weather like that. So it does shut the city down when there's other, any inclement weather. But it really does teach you to be on your own. And I remember after 9-11, there was a news broadcast that said, you know, people are thinking about tall buildings or vulnerabilities, or maybe terrorists might attack this one place here in town that had nuclear reactors, and it was big thing and the news was like actually no if just a stick of dynamite under the dam would cause massive destruction and I thought how irresponsible of the media to put that out there but it's out there and now we all can't be naive to if I know it bad guys know it and there are, is ways to make real catastrophic damage in any community there's vulnerabilities water supply etc so for every family to really have something as a go-to, not just for defense, but for survival. There, there's a whole lot more to being your own first responder than, than just the firearm. And a girl in the gun gets into a lot of that now, too. I'm going to share with you two stories. One was a little bit a while ago and was very recent. The recent one is, you know the toilet paper shortage? Yeah. I'm sorry, I had all of it. <laughs> no, I didn't have all of it. But I saw what was going on. I used to, one of the things I did was I was on a state committee in Illinois for preparing for chemical and biological attacks. And this was post 9-11 when the anthrax letters were being sent out. And I saw what was happening. And before all the shutdowns, I stocked up on exactly, not really to, I did to buy a lot of tuna and peanut butter, but I went to, you know, everyone's at the grocery stores. I went to Dick's Sporting Goods and I bought the camping dry, freeze-dried food, which we'd never opened. 
we still have, but it's good for 25 years. So we have that. If there's a snowstorm in the winter and guess what? We don't have anything in the house to eat. We're going to break open that. We usually have stuff to eat. I mean, I have teenagers, so we have stuff to eat for about five minutes after I go grocery shopping and the only thing left are the screen windows in the house. And that's what they use to strain the noodles. So obviously I'm making a joke here, but the whole idea is to become as self-sufficient or more self-sufficient, I should say, than your neighbor. And if you can become more self-sufficient, you also have the ability to help or to barter or to trade. And I'm talking, that's, it's fantasy, it's down the road, but during COVID, you know, we, we were all isolated. The other thing that I want to bring up, you, you mentioned 9-11. In preparing, I was, at the time, prior to 9-11, I was the director of security at a high school in Chicago. And one of my jobs was to create what they called crisis plans. Now they're called all hazard plans 25 years later, but at the time they were, what do we do if there's a disaster? So what kind of disasters did we have? potentially. Right next to the school was a set of train tracks that had hazardous chemicals going back and forth. If there's a train derailment, that's a threat to the school. And a lot of it, like I I keep using the word fantasy, is fantasy. What happens if a parent abducts, a non-custodial parent abducts their child? What's the the procedure? What's the procedure for a bomb threat? And about springtime 2001, I was in a meeting with the then superintendent, and he was. I was given a report. This is in front of all the director, the department heads, the directors, and I was telling everyone what the topics were in in these crisis plans. They were still in development, and I mentioned, this is spring 2001. What is the school going to do if there's a terrorist attack in the United States? Now, like I said, it's creative thinking. We didn't really think it was going to happen, but my contract ended. I moved on to municipal law enforcement, and about a month after 9-11, I got a phone call from the school. How did you know? And the answer is, and hopefully this helps people, I didn't know. I was just planning for the worst, hoping for the best, and it worked out. And what the school ended up doing is they ended up I'll call it a soft lockdown, although it wasn't as strongly stated as I stated. They they kept the kids in the classrooms. There was no passing periods. They brought in TVs. They brought in bottled water, you know, snacks for the kids. And the counseling staff ramped up what it was doing, went from classroom to classroom to check on the mental health of the students. So I'm a big believer in prepare for disasters and hope that there are none. Is I'm going to go back to my questions now. Is a girl and a gun involved in politics, or is it more focused on training, or both? We're we're definitely focused on training. That is our heart mission. That is what we do. We want to get women off the sidelines of their lives. So often women say, oh, I'll shoot that match someday, or I'll learn that someday, or I'd love to have more time to have that. Someday it'll happen. And so we really try to make someday be today and get women out uh, shooting the match today and learning what they need to learn and getting the gear they need to have so that they're ready to jump into life and not sit on the sidelines. But I wouldn't say we're involved in politics, but we are definitely involved in advocacy. So we, the work that we do is nonpartisan, but it is Second Amendment related. I do a lot of advocacy with lawmakers. I go and share my story with them, let them know that moms that make demands to take our rights don't speak for moms like me. Moms like me want to be able to have our Second Amendment right, our God-given right to self-defense, our inherent right to self-defense that's protected by the Second Amendment, that's really important to us. And it's important that lawmakers hear that because so often they're bombarded with a lot of the other side rhetoric and they need to know that we're out there too, um, that it's important to me and it's something that I value strongly as a mom and for our family. So I spend a lot of time advocacy in advocacy, advocating for uh, the right to self-defense and not just for firearms, but for all arms for pepper spray, to be, have that in public for different knives, for different tools, because you need different tools for different problems. And uh, it's important that we all have well-rounded skills, but that we can also communicate effectively about why we need them and that we should have them. You know, it's interesting how well, what you're saying, and, and I'm eating up everything you're saying. We are of like mind. I look at myself as a safety educator, Do I write a letter every now and then to my elected official? Yes, but all of my elected officials 
in where I live are very anti-gun, and some of them won't even take my calls for, hey, congratulations on winning the election, because they know I'm, I'm pro-gun, which is a little ridiculous. But when I train couples, always, every, 100% of the time, the female shoots better than the male every time. It is hilarious. And what I end up doing is uh, at the end of the lesson or the class or whatever it happens to be, I turn to the husband and I usually, or the boyfriend, and I usually say, maybe you should call 911 while she defends the family. And everyone's shocked by that. But it's true. Women shoot better than men all the time. And it's, it's hilarious. I'm also a big believer in if there is a population or a subset of a population that is an at risk uh, identifier. So for example, last night I was at the range and I was training two people in the, who were trans in the LGBTQ movement. They were asking things like, are we going to have a problem at the range? And I was like, no, first of all, you're with me. I'm, I'm kind of a no, local known at the ranges that I go to, at least not every range. But they, you know, I walk in, they say, hey, it's like Norm from Cheers. Norm! But they say, Marcus! Every place I go. So, uh, and I go to a small number of places. But they asked if they were going to be have any problems. And I told them, I said, look, these were male to female. And I said, you're going to have your biggest risk when you are dressed as a female because someone might not like that and attack you. And so I'm a big believer. There, there's been a big Jewish contingent that have been taking my classes in the last month. The fact that I actually had to take more classes. I'm big on if somebody's at risk and they're a good person, they're not you know, a convicted felon who's murdered four people, I'm happy to train them. One of the things that you said, which is a great segue, and I read about this in the Truth About Guns website, is that you want to take the word mom back from moms demand action. I think that's a brilliant tagline. It's a brilliant goal. Can you expand on that? Yeah, that's basically it. Is the Moms Demand Action has made it sound as though every mom is on the same page. You know, they use words like gun violence and all of these scary words. And what I find frustrating about that organization is that many of them don't have any experience with firearms. I'm, I'm sure some do. I don't want to make too broad a generalization, but I've been on panels before with representatives of that organization. And here I am with my name, my credentials, my resume and CV of all the training I've taken, the professional credentials I have, I would never claim to be an expert because when you on this journey, you know, there's always more to learn. But I would say that I have a certain number of professional credentials that give me the authority to speak on certain topics. And they had none. Their only credential was that they were a mom, which is important. I'm a mom too. I have three, three kids. But I don't feel that that alone gives me the credentials to speak on certain topics. Just because I'm a mom doesn't mean I can diagnose or I can, I even homeschooling moms learn a lot before they homeschool. Like there's a lot to having the credentials and professionally to do something professionally and to give your expert opinion on something. And that was what bothered me is that they often go out and speak in panels about topics that they have no background in, they had no formal education in, that their information they get is from Wikipedia and the news, which is really fabricated and false. And so unless they have taken classes on uh, response management, disaster management, emergency planning, violence, aftermath, uh, um, triage, all of those things, unless they have that expertise, they really shouldn't be providing opinions on it. And that's my opinion on it, of course. But I, I didn't like that the women on the panel that I was with a couple of years ago, they wouldn't even use their names. Their only credential was that they were moms, which I didn't ask for proof of that, but they didn't even use their names because they felt that there was such a stigma of speaking out against gun owners that they had a risk of violence towards them, which I found completely ridiculous. So um, that kind of is why I want to take the word mom back. Here I am speaking from the heart as a mom, but also as a professional in this industry that has the credentials to back up the information I'm providing. Robin, I appreciate your humbleness, but do you know the difference between an expert and a know-it-all? You said you're not an expert, but you're an expert. An expert is someone who continues to learn once they've learned it all, and they'll admit when they're wrong, or they'll admit that they don't know something. That's an expert. And whether you look at yourself or not, I look at, we've been talking 15, 20 minutes. You're very educated on this, very articulate. I would call you an expert. 
You might not be comfortable with you calling you an expert, but you're awesome. We talked about you being an anti-gunner, and you are actually on the cover of Time magazine. That is completely impressive to me. How did that happen? What was that like? That was a project from an artist who wanted to get together people who were very vocal in the gun debate, uh, both sides of it. And so I was invited to be a part of that panel. So it's actually a collage of different people. It was an interactive event. It was from this artist, JR, who does these huge panoramas and big murals. It actually was on the side of a building in New York City for a very long time. I think it was there a couple months that was on the side of this building. And then it was moved. The panels are now in the Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody, Wyoming. So it's on display there. The really nice thing is that it's interactive. So when you you're able to click on or touch a person, their picture, and then you can hear in their own words, their narrative and bio and why they feel the way they feel about firearms. So when I first was invited to do this project, I have to admit I was kind of nervous because you never know in media nowadays, it's how you're going to be portrayed if you would, you know, be seen as, if, if they would just paint you in a really poor light. And so I was very nervous about it, but I thought I'm going to be true to myself. I'm going to stay my journey and, and the same thing I shared with you. And so I took my favorite AR, which has a unicorn on it. Um, it was designed for me. It has a, My forehand has a unicorn, and the colors are gold and gray because my daughter is a brain cancer fighter, oh. and childhood cancer is gray. The color awareness color is gray, and ch- uh, childhood cancer is gold, and brain cancer is gray. And so they made this unicorn for me because I would say that she's she shows me every day that the impossible is possible. So I have a lot of things with unicorns on it. So I took my favorite AR that has a unicorn on it. And I just took a picture. Uh, I stood in this big green screen room in a warehouse in Dallas. I had to travel there. And, um, yeah, so I I took this picture, and then they put it into the mural. And so that was a little bit nerve-wracking, too, because you don't know where you're going to be in the mural, who you're going to be next to, how they're going to portray you. So it was was pretty nerve-wracking. But overall, the end project, he was true to his word. The artist wanted to share both sides the passion, the anger, the hurt, the emotion, the fear from both sides. You know, I'm afraid of them taking my rights. Uh, others are afraid of, of victim being a victim. Others are afraid of not having the tools if you are a victim. You know, there's all these emotions relating to our journey. And so uh, it was a real honor to be part of that project, and I love that it will kind of, at least for the short term, live in perpetuity in Cody, Wyoming, in that amazing museum. And it was been pretty fantastic for friends and colleagues of mine to go to the museum and see it and that it's still relevant today it's it's a nice way to to share our stories i have never been to wyoming but i actually travel the country as a keynote presenter on overcoming the human stress response now that i know it's there when i get a gig in wyoming guess where i'm gonna visit i'm gonna check it out it's a great museum anyway aside from just the mural it's a, a fantastic museum Terrific. Have you been in Texas for most of your life? Yes, I grew up in Dallas, and I have lived in Austin for 30 years. What? And you are an anti-gunner from Texas? Okay, I'm kidding. I'm just... No, that's a myth. I'm glad you brought that up because oh, people think that everybody in Texas is a gun-toting person. And it's actually, uh, Texas is not one of our more gun-friendly states. We have a lot of work to do here in advocacy. That Texas is pretty middle of the road, but there are a lot of roadblocks and... and um, a lot of red tape to gun ownership that people don't realize. They think everyone in Texas kind of takes it for granted. But those of us who are on the front line, you know, I want that single mom to be able to get the protection she needs. I want that low in, low-income family to be able to not have all of these fees and fines and all these roadblocks uh, financially and time-wise to get the security that they need. So there's actually a lot of work here in Texas. It's better than it has been now that we're a constitutional carry state, but it, there's definitely, it is a myth that everybody in Texas is pro gun. And especially now with, we've had such an influx of Californians moving in. So our culture has changed a little bit, especially in the cities, but um, a lot of us are still here fighting the fight. Very good. What would you say is the most gun friendly state? Uh, I would probably say Indiana. Really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I thought okay. you were going to say Arizona, but uh, Indiana, that's, that's quite interesting. Illinois is, Exactly the Arizona opposite. Arizona has, uh, you know, the Giffords from Arizona and right. Senator Kelly, they do a lot of work against 
uh, the right to keep and bear arms in Arizona. So um, it's definitely not as bad as Hawaii and New Jersey and, and the, the fight that you guys have in, in Chicago land area. But uh, every state has its unique challenges. And so that's why it's really important that people share their voice because every state's legislatures are set up different. Here in Texas, our legislature only meets every other year for 180 days. Our constitution was written so that no one could be a career politician. You have to go have a real job and just come to Austin for part of the time. But a lot of states have a lot of authority and in their legislatures and in the governor position. And so it's important that everybody understands how their state operates and to share their voice, get involved in your local Citizens Defense League. I've, I know a lot of guys from the Illinois Citizens Defense League, and they're always fighting the fight up there. So it's a great organization to get involved with. I never heard of it. I'm going to check them out. The website is a agirlandagun.org, all spelled out, except for the org part. It's O-R-G. And there's a, a photo. I have to ask you about this fabulous photo on there. It has not, it's just you sitting with a bunch of other people. Maybe it's in a class. Maybe it was staged. You're in color, and I'm colorblind, so I actually saw that, which is amazing, and everyone else is in black and white. How did you do that? <laughs> well, that's, that's on our leadership page, and so it was kind of just to highlight me as a leader. It's kind of silly, but I'm glad you like it. That was just something that our web team put together. Um, okay. Yeah, that was a class. It was authentic. We were actually listening to a presentation, and so um, everything on our site is authentic. Uh, we have anything staged. It's all real people doing real things, and we're just I'm really fortunate that I have the best community of people who want us to succeed and, and love the work that we're doing. And so everybody, these are all, you know, real women and we're all, it's all real smiles and that's what makes everything worth it. That's awesome. It's, it's a terrific photo and I'm a little bit of a snob. So the fact that I liked it, I was like, wow, that's, that's awesome. We'll be right back and we'll be continuing the conversation regarding a girl and a gun. Stay tuned. The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYMLLP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. <laughs> 